Turn your Bibles to Acts, the fourth chapter, verse 32. Acts 4.32. This is a section that is often overlooked. It seems when I hear preaching and teaching and talking about the book of Acts, we want to go from one jail setting where God miraculously set Peter and John free into the other setting where they were arrested again, this time beaten, but yet they were set free. And whenever we get into this section, particularly the first 11 verses of uh, chapter 5, there's too many so-called funny jokes said about them. I want you to know what this passage of Scripture is not about this morning. If you've ever heard anyone say, whether it be a pastor or anyone else, if you don't watch out and pay your tithes, God will kill you. And, and many times I have heard that, most often in jest, but it does not do script justice to Scripture. And if there's one thing in life you don't want to make a joke about, where there is no joke, and that's Scripture. In this passage are some of the deepest truths that you and I need in life. To be sure, there are stewardship principles as in every, just about every book of the Bible. We understand or need to understand we are not owners, we are stewards. As it is said many times in the passage we're going to read, and as you read again over in chapter 3, the, the philosophy, you may call it, or the mindset of this church was this. They did not say that anything they had was their own. They recognized that by the grace, mercy, and blessing of God, what they had was a gift from God, and they were to be a steward of that gift. Uh, just recently I heard someone who was really kind of down and uh, seemed like nothing in life had been going good and one problem after another, and they were almost at the point of excusing it away. And uh, then they said, you know, they're... While I'm griping about what I don't have, there's three-fourths of the world who don't have near what I have. They're starving, they're hungry, they have no place to live. And I said to him, you know, God blessed you with where you were born, where you were raised, and the possessions that you have. Now the question I would ask you is what are you going to do with what God has given you? Where we are born was not our making. We just showed up one day. The place that we live, designed and directed by God. There are millions upon millions, billions of people not blessed like we are. So even as we see in this story, the blessings that the billions that don't have need comes from the billions of us who do have placed in our hands, reaching out with the blessings of God. It's one of the principles in this message. Another principle is this. This was a very young, struggling church. I mean, it just came together and the power of preaching the power of the Holy Spirit the love of people and the spirit of God living in them and yet God knew that this young struggling church had to be strong because Satan will not sit by and allow a church or you to go untended in this world if you think you've got a get-out-of-jail uh, card, get-out-of-jail-free card, you better have another thing coming. The Apostle Peter said it best. Satan is crouching at your door, waiting 
Now, we're not to be afraid and stay in the house. We're to walk out in the power of God. And so God knew, because some people look at this passage, we're going to see a man and his wife drop dead. And, and I've had many people say, wow, that's strong. You probably shouldn't preach that message when you have guests in your church. Well, guests, this morning I'm not going to apologize for preaching this message. Because this is the gospel. And there's a reason behind it. That church had to be strong. And you need to understand that a church that has sin in its place is a church that is at risk. And a Christian that has sin in their life is a Christian who is at risk. And so God, in his abundance of mercy to us, shared with us the early beginnings of the church, including the need to make sure that no man forgot that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In chapter 4, verse 32, you should have that by now. We read, now, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one, you can go back and say, no one of the full number said that there was anything that belonged to him that it was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony of, to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. And there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. Understand this kind of is like a picture of what you have just done this morning. We have received tithes and offerings. They will go into our church account, and from that account we will minister in the community to the needs of the people. That is the concept of laying them at the feet of the apostles. And it was distributed to each as they had need. Thus Joseph who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. I want you to understand, and I may say this again, but it'll be emphasis if I do, there's a misconception that Barnabas was the only one that sold land or possessions and brought it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Because when you read that, it said, For as many that had the lands and the possessions sold them. Also, you need to understand that that did not leave anyone out. There is no such thing as a great offering to the Lord or a small offering to the Lord. You recall Jesus was sitting where, they, where he could see the treasure and people putting their money in. And a lady walked up with something that would not buy hardly anything, placed it in this offering, and God said, she has given more than anyone else because she's given her all. And so don't as many times as taught, Barnabas was the only man that sold his property. No, that's not true. Or there were just a few that gave. All things in common meant there is a need there, and everybody got together, and as they could, and as God led, they gave. Chapter 5. Always when you see the word but, <laughs> it's not like therefore. Therefore, it's going to take you back and say, remember this good stuff you just heard? When you see but, you know something's coming. A man named Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his not wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit 
and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men arose, wrapped him up, and carried him out and buried him. And after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell dead. And, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. One other point before we go into the message. This is the first time the group of individuals who came to Christ, gathered together in a fellowship, was called the church in the book of Acts. And there is about 20 to 25 other occurrences where the church became known as a localized body in a certain location that is reflective of the overall universal body of Christ. They're fixing to go into some problems. And God said, you're my church. Fathers, we come to you today. Blessed be your name and blessed be your word, Lord. As we gather around these scriptures this morning, I pray, Father God, that you would open our hearts I pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak through us in a way that, Lord, we'll hear you. That we can say to you, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. For, Lord, there are truths here. Father, I pray today, this is a day that every person, Lord, that sit here without a saving knowledge of you would come to know you, O oh God. Lord, meet every need. Strengthen us. And bless you for what you're going to do in the church today. In Jesus' name, amen. This young church was remarkable. Because the young church had a very, very mature view of material possessions. They viewed the things that they had as not their own, but that they belonged to God. And I think that if we really thought about it, those who would say, I own this or I have this, if we were really to think, we would have to understand that for the grace of God, we would not have and we would not be able to hold on to. So that makes us this steward of God. You can liken it to God giving the talents. When Jesus spoke about the talents, he gave ten, he gave five, and he gave two. And he expected what God had been given to those people for them to invest those in kingdom work and get a reward in order that not that it would go into a bank or an IRA or some kind of, of uh, investments, but that it, it would be invested back into the ministry of the Lord God. You see, the preaching of the resurrection continued, and they had a great, great boldness. We read just last week how uh, Peter would, and John were threatened. The church, in response, prayed that they would have boldness. What we've just re read said, great grace came upon them. In other words, God answered that prayer in order to speak the word with boldness and live the world with a word in boldness and to share in boldness. These, these verses that I read to you in chapter 4 
show what I've often called living with open hands. Uh, have you ever seen the picture of the little jar where it's kind of big at the bottom and small at the top? And there's a monkey, and he's got his hand in there, and he's grabbed a, a bunch of peanuts or whatever, and he can't get it out because he won't let go of what he has. He could get one and come out with it, but he's got the fist. That's not open-handed living. Open-handed living means that those that had a need could take from that, that open hand, and at the same time, those that had that open hand could receive the blessings that God is going to put in that hand. This is a message we shy away from because of some wrong teachings in it, but the, it is a very definite teaching of God that God blesses His work. God provides for His work. And so this church believed in the blessing of giving, and how many of us can say how good it makes us feel inside? You know, sometimes you, you worry about pride welling up. You do something for somebody, you just, you see that smile, you see the relief, and it's just like, wow, that's good. That's a blessing from God. And when you have that hand to help, there's also that hand that will be filled. Understand this, the church did not require anyone to sell property, the church did not have tithing envelopes. The church did not check the 1040s to figure what percentage of your wealth should be given. These are practices, by the way, that happen in many churches. If you don't believe me, I'll tell you where to go and join, and they'll ask you for a copy of last year's uh, 1040. Uh, because that's too many times how people do things today. But you see, the pattern that we see here in the early church in the first century is a pattern that's to be followed here in the 21st century should God re delay his return in the 22nd uh, century and throughout the race. This is the genesis of the body of Christ. So no one was required but this guy Barnabas. He had to be an encouraging guy because the apostles called him Barnabas, which meant sons of encouragement. And so he had this field, more than likely back in Cyprus where he lived. He sold the field and he laid that money down, not for any other reason except Barnabas looked around. There was more needs than there was to fit those needs he knew that he had a piece of property, and so he simply sold it and brought it back. Then comes Ananias and Sapphira. They see that. Now what we is implied through here pretty strongly is that Ananias and Sapphira had a meeting, let's say, at supper time. And they said, you know that boy Barnabas, everybody is talking about Barnabas. I mean, he seems to be the head guy in our new church simply because he sold some land and gave it to the church. I'll tell you what we can do. We've got a little lot down here. We can sell that lot and we can say we're going to give the money from the sale of the church or of the lot to the church. And Sophia probably said, well, honey, you know, we can't really do that, afford to do that. We, we have the, he said, listen, I've got a plan. They don't know what we're going to get for that land. So we'll hold back enough that we can get by and we will just go and give the rest to the church. And all was well because they could become large in the eyes of the people they could give that gift, and yet, it was a gift that really didn't cost them anything. The problem is, as Peter pointed out, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. Too many times in our life, in our actions, in our words, in our lives, we don't realize that we are lying first to the Spirit of God that is in us. 
We are telling the Spirit, you don't see what you see. You don't hear what you hear. I don't see you out of sight, out of mind. I'm okay. But the Spirit of God is God. It's not a lesser God because we sometimes say the third person of the Godhead. There is no as far as one, two, or three. All are God fully and entirely. Barnabas brought a willing sacrifice, Ananias and Sapphira wanted praise and they wanted a claim. You see, Peter said to him, you have kept back. In that Greek word, kept back, it means to pilfer, it means to steal, it means to embezzle. And if you go to Joshua, the seventh chapter, and read about the battle of Ai, There was a man named Achan. Joshua had said that all of the spoils are to be destroyed, burnt, done away with. But as Achan went through after that battle, he balanced whatever needs he may have had by what he saw, and he stole them. He kept them back from God and he put him under his tent to the costing of his and his family's life because he had indeed lied to the Spirit of God because he had said, we will do what you have told us to do. It was a lie. Lying is an outward sin. I I don't like to be lied to. I don't know anybody that likes to be lied to. I would rather to know a truth that I didn't want to know than to know a lie that made me think I know something I don't know. Just shoot it straight. It's an outward offense, but at the same time, there's more than lying is involved. You just don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to lie. There's pride involved. There was a pride of Ananias. He wanted the acclaim that Barnabas had. There is jealousy. Well, if that guy can do it, I can do it. I can remember being sales and a young man in Orlando in a very, one of the most first exclusive areas of Orlando. And I knocked on the door. I'd been called there. I sold termite work and people had termites, sure enough. And uh, I sold her a job and charted the job, got ready. She gave me a check. I walked out. And I noticed a lady across the street going, come here, come here. So, you know, being a salesman, well, kids who lives on commissions, you go. And she said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I I work with Orkin. She said, well, what's going on over there? I said, well, you know, that's private business. I can't, I don't want to get into it, but obviously they have a pest problem and now we're going to fix it. She said, listen, her husband works for my husband. I want you to do the same thing for us that you're going to do for them, but I want you to charge us double. And I said, man, y'all's houses are about the same. Doesn't matter. My husband is the boss. Her husband works for my husband. I want you to charge us double. And so at 15% on the dollar, I had a smile you could not wipe off of my face for several weeks because I granted her request. Had I been a Christian then, I would have simply said, as you say, so shall it be. That's pride. That's jealousy. That is the basis behind what we see from Ananias. Not only that, there's hypocrisy. He had probably announced to the people, there's no other way Peter would have known how much he had held back. If he hadn't announced, I've sold the land for this, now I'm going to give it to the Lord. And when the offering came up short, it was simply hypocrisy and deception. Can you see this is just a whole lot more than somebody holding back on a gift 
that had been promised to the Lord. Now, how did this happen? Ananias and Sapphira were part of the early people who believed. They were Christians. They were a part of this organization. Peter flatly said, you were influenced by Satan. I want to tell you a myth this morning that's leading many people astray in their lives. There are people who say, I am exempt as a Christian from the influence of Satan. And that, my friends, is a lie. No Christian is exempt from falling under the influence of Satan. Let me quickly tell you, you cannot be controlled by Satan, but you can be influenced to the degree that you will fill out his scurrilous plans. And that happens day after day and time after time. Satan influenced them in the early settings. Do you realize had that scandal got out, there would have probably been a church business meeting and there would be those that was for Ananias and Sapphira and there would be those who were against and the next thing you know, a young struggling church would be split down the middle. God had to act quickly and he had to protect the church and not only protect that church, but down through the centuries, as we read this Word of God, it should be a message to us to protect our church. You can be used by Satan. Verse 7, somebody says, poor old Sapphira, <laughs> bless her heart, she had a rotten husband. Maybe, but after an interval of three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what happened. And Peter said to me, tell me, did you sell the land for this much? And she said, yes, we did. You know, I imagine she just kind of perked all up. She had a hat on. She might have fixed that thing. She was, oh, man, they're fixing to say, you're going to be the head of WMU or something. I'm here. Yeah, we did that. Dead. And then I, Sapphira, had followed the lead of her husband. Now I want you to listen to me very carefully and if you misquote me, it's being recorded. Last week I said when the government of any kind ordains, demands ungodly action from its citizens, you are to follow God and not man. That's, the, that's it. If what the government says you must do is ungodly and against God, then you do what God says. Ladies, I want to tell you this morning, you may have an unbelieving husband. And that husband may make demands on you that pierce the heart of your morality. Things that you know that you shouldn't do and yet you have read Husbands submit or wives submit to your husband and you think I'm under the bondage when he says jump I ask how high on the way down. I want to tell you this morning if your husband demands from you ungodly immoral things you are not instructed to follow that husband. Okay? You say, well, what do I do? I've had wife after wife over the years tell me, I just do this so I can win him to the Lord. And I say to her, how in the world joining in what he does is going to show him that there is a different life to be lived? You have to take a stand on the side of God. Now, I'm not trying to break up marriages or anything else. Because there is a solution. Ladies, Peter said this. Likewise, wives, he said, be subject to your own husband, so that it, even if some do not believe or obey the word, they will be one without a word. You have never nagged anybody into church. And I want to tell you, the thing that used to make me the maddest when my 
sweet Christian wife would get up and get the kids ready to start the church. She'd say, are you going? And I would say no. And I was ready for a fight. I needed to justify what I knew I was doing that was wrong. So I needed that fight. So I could say, huh, boy, she put me down in front of the kids. But all she'd do is kiss me on the cheek. And she'd say, dinner's on the stove. We'll eat when we get back. And she never, in front of my children or to me, condemned me. But yet when I wanted to do something on Sunday, she'd look at me in them big browns and say, baby, you know, I go to church on Sunday. Those were things that I could not fight. Because she wasn't hitting me with the Bible. She wasn't quoting the Bible verses on everything I did wrong. She simply lived out the life of Christ in her. And I loved her. And I began to want what she has. You win them without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let the adorning be external the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold, but let your adorning be in the hidden person of the heart and the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is precious. I'm not dumb. I realize that there are battles that go on over just such issues as this. The tremendous pressure But I want to plead and tell you this morning that according to the the authority of the Word of God, no matter how hard it is to be faithful to the Word, the Word overcomes and the Word wins the situation. Compromising the Word has never won a situation. Let me go a little further. Husbands, <laughs> listen to me. This is a good word for you as well. You're to love your wife. You're to lead your wife in the way of the Lord. You're to stand firm in your faith. And you are not to be swayed by an unbelieving wife. What I just got through saying for one is good for you. Dabbling in what they dabble in is not going to win her or anyone else over. The Lord has commanded that a man is to love his wife, meaning the welfare, leading her in paths. She may not want to go, but leading her, not dragging her. And by your conduct, and by your faithfulness to the Word, you can win that wife. You see, we're in this together, and compromising never did anything for the Lord. There's something else here that a lot of people don't bring out. But I have done more studying in the last month on just one passage of Scripture, I think, than any couple of verses that I have in a long time. In this little story, we see the validation that there is a sin unto death. I don't know if you've ever read that in the Bible. I don't know if you've ever heard that. But the Bible plainly says there is a sin unto death. Now let me debunk the myth before we get going. Many people say it's this sin or that sin or this or the other. And there are great arguments about what this sin is. I'm not smart, but I can settle the argument. What the sin is, is in the heart and mind of God alone, and it is not mentioned or written anywhere. The passage that I refer to is 1 John 5, verses 13 through 15. John is talking to these people, and I, don't you think it's remarkable that it's John that the Holy Spirit uses to pen these words? 
John, of the Peter and John who were in this situation in the early church? He's talking about praying in the will of God. That is the, the connotation of what he's written. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. The emphasis is praying in the will of God, the known will. We excuse it by saying, I don't know what God's will for my life is. Usually we mean it, what new car I should buy, what house, should I sell my house, should I take this job, should I marry this man, should I marry this woman. We equate so many things in life and we get all upset about what is the will of God, what is the will of God. Listen, the will of God is to walk in Christ Jesus. To know and to love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. As we've said for weeks, prayer is connecting you to the voice of God even more than connecting you to the ear of God. Prayers are not to try to conjole and convince to do God anything. They're the opportunity to talk things out and allow God to come in and say, let me adjust you. And you simply pray. This is my will. If you know a promise that's written in the Bible, and there are many, I have them down for circumstances that I need to pray for. And I simply pray back to God the words that he said. And say, here it is, Lord. But then he says this. If anyone sees a brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins, that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death, and I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that leads unto death. All wrongdoing is sin. Now, you, it's kind of confusing because he's saying to you, don't pray for the one who has committed the sin that is a sin unto death and yet you don't know what that sin is. No, that's not what he's saying. Go back up to what I read to you. If we ask anything according to his will. If we are in the will of God, God will direct that prayer. And if someone that we're praying for should, should die, we immediately cannot say that person committed the sin and the death. Don't, that's not what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit through John is simply saying you're praying in the will of God, but you need to understand that there is a sin that will lead to death. This sin could be any premeditated, unconfessed sin that causes the Lord to determine that that believer will not change. Again, we don't know who that is unless it's us because the Spirit of God will be pleading with you. And it's not one particular sin or another. It's whatever sin God determines is the final one. Failure to repent of and forsake sin may eventually lead you to a physical death. However... Not all death and all disease is divine judgment. I like to say if you walk into a room, if you go work, no, I won't use that illustration. Nobody will ever work back there again. Let's say you go to your kid's school and those kids have measles and you've never had measles and you serve them cupcakes and hug them and love on them. Congratulations. You've probably got measles. You didn't sin, you were just there, and you were vulnerable to it. And you see, that's the way sin is in our life. Sin is there. We're vulnerable to it. God knows we are, so he gives us this prayer. Oh, God, have mercy. God, 
Help me. I confess that sin. There is a mindset that once you become a Christian, God gives you carte blanche to sin all you want to because you can't lose your salvation and all of your sins were judged on the cross. And there are people who believe that garbage and there are people who are living a life under the con condemning hand of God not knowing it. Now understand something this morning. If you're sitting there thinking, I got out of bed to come out here and scare you guys, that's not the truth. But I'll tell you what, as your pastor, I'm going to tell you the truth. If you don't like the truth, you talk to the man that gave me the truth and see if it's okay with him. Because I'll tell you, you and I, not just me, we are mutually responsible for each other. And there are times, and I know there are times that people have called Tyler and said, Hey, Tyler, pull it back, buddy. Or some kind of conversation. But see, we, we, we live in secluded little caverns. And, and we think that we are not, we are not to meddle in people's lives. But you are involved in people's lives simply because you know that life. Simply because you may love that person. And if you see something that could, listen, if that person was fixing to walk out in front of a car and they didn't see the car, would you sit there and say, well, I'm just going to mind my own business. That's not my fault. You can't put that on me. I'm not going to meddle. How much more serious an issue when someone continuously, continually, blatantly sins before Almighty God? No one knows when God's had enough. And folks, that's the scary part. No one knows but God. But I'm telling you, God will protect his church. God will protect his people any way that he can. The results of that, great fear. Great fear came upon not just the whole church, but all that heard. You see, this is unscientific, but I believe it's true. 99.999% of churches who have issues to the problem where they dissolve, where they become weak, or where they become ineffective, the problem is always inside. It's inside. If somebody outside attacks, we circle the wagons right next to people we may not be speaking to, but now they're against us. The purity of the church is maintained on the inside. And when the purity of the church is strong, when we are a confessing our sins People, when we are an encouraging people, the body of Christ is strong. And then we can stand against all of the errors of the evil one because we're not scattered. In this instance, we're gathered, united in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah, he's a, if you have not read a lot about Jeremiah, you need to get in that book. It's, Jeremiah's a great man. He wept all the way through his ministry because God told him you're going to preach and nobody's going to respond. <laughs> I don't know how many preachers would strap on that. But in the middle of a conflict, sure defeat and overthrow God said, I want you to go buy a plot of land. <laughs> now, take it, they're, they're overthrowing. They're fixing to take everybody out of Jerusalem. Land values are nothing. You can, when Israel's taken out, you can go in and get anything you want. But buy a piece of land. I want you to get the deed recorded and witnessed and sealed. So Jeremiah did it. And this is what he said. Ah, Lord God, 
It is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Noah built a boat in the desert before there was rain, taking ridicule for 120 years. Moses left the pleasures of Pharaoh's palaces because he wanted to identify with the people of God. Abraham offered up the hope of Israel, Isaac, offered and actually laid him on an altar. I always think of the verse, present yourself as a living sacrifice to me, holy and acceptable. Abraham put him there because he believed God could raise him from the dead. Here's the issue this morning. For all the stuff we say we believe and all the stuff that we're ready to fight over at the drop of a hat, how much do you really believe God? Think about it. What are some of the circumstances in your life that you've given up on simply because Oh, well, God can't do that. How many of you have heard the call of God, come to me and have life? Be my son, be my daughter. You say, I can't do it. I can't give it up. I can't live it. How many of us live our life in the without column because we simply don't believe God? Friends, the book, the words, and the God who said, buy a piece of land. Jeremiah is mine, said, if I'm going to buy it, and God tells me to, one day I can sit under my vine, drink the wine from its grapes, and enjoy the harvest. See, he believed God. And that's the issue this morning in your life and in my life. Do we believe God or do we go through the motions of the singing, the listening, the going, the agreeing it was good? Or do we do the hard thing in our life realizing, number one, I will not, as a child of God, allow myself by the power of God to be a tool used by Satan. But with everything that is within me, I surrender my all to the Lord God. As the vessel he made in his hands to simply do with as he sees fit, knowing he'll bring joy in my heart. This morning, if you're without Christ, Don't hold on to a losing situation. Because staying lost, really, we don't know when the Lord is going to give up and say it's time to reap the harvest and return. And at that point, it's over. No appeals court. So I would hearken the words of the Bible. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, Harden not your hearts. Come to him. Our fathers, we come to you this morning. It is not by our power or might that you convict of sin. It's the word of God, Father. I believe you convict us and break us with tears in your eyes because you love us and you know that if you don't break us, we're heading for things that are going to be disastrous. Lord, today, you know what's in the life of your people. What is it that they need to say that with your mighty 
power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is impossible with you. May the day they lay that at your feet. May the day that may they lay shackles and chains and bondages at your feet. Walk away of freedom and life, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.